What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. Dead Meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea. We're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. This week, we are doing another movie review uh, because of time stuff, time constraints. We've been on set all weekend with our friend Zorin. Yeah. Filming. Can we say? Yeah, we can say. He's been po- He did a Kickstarter for it. It's fine for so slow. So slow. Wow. <laughs> It's going to be a long episode. Social Media Asicus 2, which if you've seen the first one, is... I love it. I'll, I'll post a link to it in the Definitely. It's very good. Yeah. It's a horror rom-com music video. It's so fucking good, dude. So we got lucky and got to be in the second one. And Zorin's not only a friend, he is an, an employee of Dead Meat. Yeah, he he does passes of the, the kill count. Oh, no, it's not passes. Oh, he, he, like, he does the up. initial coverage with movie footage over the script that I send him. Damn. So. Hugely important role in the kill count editing process and a, a person who has saved my life in terms of free time. Yeah. It is because of Zorin <laughs> that you, Zorin. we're able to have a relationship, yeah. <laughs> which is pretty cool. Thank you, Zorin. Thanks, Zorin. Zorin. So yeah, show him some support mm-hmm. uh, by checking out his music video in the link yeah. and looking forward to the second part, yeah. which Chelsea's in. I'm in it a bunch. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm oh. super excited. But yeah, so, so we've been very busy with that. So this episode... Um, it, it's just going to be a review. I'm not really going to do any clips because I'm going to have no time to edit this. We, I'm going to do the childhood fears episode that I was asking you to email me about on Twitter next week. Yeah. And your responses to that are so funny. I asked you guys to send me things that you were kind of irrationally afraid of as kids, movies that weren't supposed to be scary, things I saw in Brave general. Little Toaster. You also have another fuzzy on your... I see you picking off fuzzies yeah. off your shirt. You have one on the side of your head. Which one? The side? Other side. The side? Oh, yeah. the camera side? Uh-huh. Oh, no. Yeah. Did I get it? Nope. Nope. Shit. Nope. Where is it? Still there. Am I close? Oh, oh, I think I felt it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Did I get it? Yeah. Cool. Uh, So, yeah, that'll be next week. Because I, I saw Brave Little Toaster on that list. Many times. Scary Brave. shit, man. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, when I was a kid. It didn't, I don't know, for some reason, for me. Do you didn't. remember that movie, though? Mm-hmm, I do. Okay. No, I mean, not super well, but I remember. Because it was a movie I would watch on repeat, so sure. it's like embedded in me. Okay, I don't know it that well. Maybe we should watch it. Okay. Scary we'll as fuck, it. dude. Yeah, but I, I didn't want to skimp on that episode. I want to be able to put in clips and stuff so I can really re-traumatize all of you. But that's nice. Like, this week, we are, we are going to review a movie that <sighs> a lot of you, yeah, I know. <laughs> that's how I feel. A lot of you requested... We, when this came out, it was nonstop over Twitter and email. And so I thought, all right, must be a horror movie we need to see that we have to review. Velvet Buzzsaw, Netflix original movie. I'm going to say right off the bat that the most annoying thing about this movie for me prior to seeing it was that every time I saw the name, I got the song Velvet Goldmine stuck in my head from mm. David Bowie. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. why I'm wearing a shirt. Uh, with Bowie, but uh, yeah, I would much rather listen to the song Velvet Goldmine for two hours straight than oh, watch this movie. Oh, yeah, and it's supposed to be kind of a play on music, right? It's like Velvet Underground kind of... I don't know. Because she I... said she's a, the main character because the Velvet Buzzsaw tattoo has and It was a... like a punk uh-huh. band, like an anarchist punk. I mean, most punk is anarchist, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> I guess but the we, problem is we this movie's really such a any, fucking but, goddamn yeah. mess... That I couldn't tell you for sure. Now you hate this. Movie. I hate it. So okay, straight up, this mo- <laughs> th- this episode, we both. I hated this. I was profoundly disappointed, and I have a feeling that by the end of this episode, I'll have moved into hate. But mostly, I was so disappointed because it's it's written and directed by Dan Gilroy, yes, who wrote and directed Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler, which I think is a ma- a much better horror film than this. Nightcrawler, it's so, is fucking it's awesome. Ama- if you haven't seen Nightcrawler, go just go see it. It's yeah. so fucking wild. It is dark, uh, like. I don't know. If you just want to watch a fucked up movie, that's a good one. Yeah, dude. Jake Gyllenhaal is so fucking creepy. And yeah, he's amazing. I remember when when this movie was getting made because they cast Jake Gyllenhaal and they recast Renee Russo, who was also in Nightcrawler. She's the news station lady that he- Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought, great. I'm, and it's about the art world. Done. I'm so excited. And- 
man, was this a big letdown. And again, that's what this episode is going to be. I, I don't think I have many great things to say about this. If you liked this movie, fine. You can like a movie. I like lots of things that people think are bad, human centipede. But <laughs> just a heads up, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna fuck around and pretend I liked it more than I did. Yeah, I had a very visceral reaction, which is sad because like it has a a good premise. The cast, the cast is, is incredible, fucking deep, I know. dude. This is a deep bench of good actors because not only do you have Jill and Hall and Russo, you got Tony Collette. Yeah, you got uh, I don't know this Zawe Ashton. She's woman. new. This is this was kind of her big. I liked her. She was, she's very good in this. Yeah, uh, you, you got Natalia Dyer from Stranger Things, mm-hmm. David Diggs from fucking Hamilton, uh-huh. uh, John Malkovich, get, getting that Netflix money some more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a great cast. It's a really good cast. And it's just <sighs> this this premise is great, the cast is great, and it's so wasted on this and that's why I think I hate it so much is there was so much potential. And I think when I was when I uh when the reviews started coming in and I was kind of reading, you know, people's first reactions to it. I saw that the reviews were pretty mixed and I'm thinking, oh, it has to be mixed because this movie's too weird. That's what it seemed like to me was it was a movie that people were very polarized on because it was too, it was it wasn't accessible. Like a mother type thing. Yes, like a, a less mother. mother. Yes, type thing. where it's it's so weird because all of the ingredients of this sound like a movie that would come out to be too weird. Like a Dan Gilroy, okay, we got Nightcrawler, we got Jake Gyllenhaal being all crazy. It's about the art world, pretentious art people. It's going to be nuts. So I'm thinking I'm going to love this because those are the movies I tend to really go to bat for. I tend to really like, I, I, I really defend and fall on the side of movies that get panned for being too weird and for taking risks because I think movies are boring if we're not taking risks, even if they end up being less than great yeah i'd rather see a movie that is too wild than one that is so boring and this one is boring as fuck i was so bored <laughs> it's, and yeah. that is such a crime to me i i think that being a boring movie is worse than being a bad movie yeah it's why i ranked uh jason goes to hell higher than a new beginning in my friday because it's not <laughs> it's not boring <laughs> it's you know just i yeah i'd like to see something take chances and this movie the the strongest opinion i have about it is in fact that no strong decisions were made during this movie like there's nothing in this movie that stands out as a a like uh confident decision on anyone's part yeah. like the script is the script's a mess it is a mess it's a fucking this mess this movie feels like it was supposed to be a season of tv yes especially the first 20 minutes because mm-hmm. we're we're meeting all this ca- uh all these yeah, characters it's it's an altman mo- it's a robert altman movie yeah i saw him compare it to uh-huh. that he compared it to the player yep. which is a great movie which is movie. a fucking great movie <laughs> fucking i'm great sorry movie. you can't say <laughs> i'm going to make a movie that's like the player and has a giant cast and then not try to make any anything with cool as fuck shots in it like that opening <laughs> that shot, opening the shot player, of like seven and a half on. minutes yeah come the fuck jeez on. go watch the player guys it's great it's not a horror it's just, no it's just a it's good just fucking great. movie with tim robbins yeah dude go watch that i have a lot of movie recommendations in this episode by the way i was thinking about stuff that i just like more and they're not even all horror. i don't think any of them are horror movies here's but- another one dude uh podcast listeners you'll get the you'll be the first ones to know i'm doing a surprise kill count for a bucket of blood in honor of dick miller yes there's a movie that uh is a satirical take on the art world from 1959 death is art murder as art yeah watch bucket of blood it's a silly movie but it picks a tone and like sticks to it that movie is a more searing critique of the art world (laughs) than this movie ever tries to be that movie you instantly understand what it's doing and it's such funny satire and it's still for me it's still funny it's an old movie you might be turned off by it like oh it's black and white but 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 the thing is is it's a roger corman movie and he those (laughs) those movies are it's weird you look back at them and it feels like they still I, they're so easy to connect to, I think, because they weren't trying to be Hollywood movies. They feel so much more real, and mm-hmm. the jokes in them are still so funny because they're just being people in those. And 
Yeah. yeah. So I yeah I Go couldn't watch help that instead. It's so I couldn't great. help but compare since I've been spending so much time with a bucket of blood lately that I'm like both of these are trying to uh, satirize the art world and bucket of blood does it a hundred percent funnier better effects better kills better oh, everything God, the effects in this are disappointing They're dude bad. The, so here's the thing with this movie is it feels like a netflix movie in the worst way yep it feels like, like the effects look cheap and the acting feels uh i don't know the, the yeah so going back to it feeling like a season of tv the acting feels like it's a TV show, too. There's so many scenes of actors where it reminds me of a network drama. Yeah. Which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that's ever a great comparison to make for me. I don't like, I don't really care about network dramas unless, we're unless talking it's about Mad Men. Certain seasons of Lost. Well, Mad Men's not. Or network sorry, drama. that's, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's cable. Yeah, yeah. I'm that's sorry. cable, that's baby. That's cable. But yeah, this reminds <laughs> me of like a, I don't know. There's, it almost has a procedural feeling about it. Ugh, it's not great. Yeah. Um. All right. Do we just want to start going through the plot? I guess let's do it because I'll have, I have more movie recommendations as we go through. <laughs> I have lots to say, and we might as well just touch on them as we're going through. Because yeah, th- th- just think about it from our perspective of sitting down. We know nothing about this movie except it's been highly recommended to us. We love the guy who made it. We like the cast. We're ready. We sit down and I we love, watch it. I love the idea of oh great, it's gonna make fun of the art world. Yeah. I'm, Every, everything about this had the ingredients for something that I was going to love. And then we so keep we that in mind. Watching, yeah. I, I did not go into this wanting to hate I don't think it. I, I don't think I uh, started to realize I disliked this until the gas station scene. Oh, I think I was we'll earlier to. than oh, okay. that. Yeah. All right, well, let's get I'll into see it, if then. I can pinpoint where I finally realized, oh, no. Sure. This is not going to get better. The credits are fine. Oh, the the animated credits. Yeah, yeah, those are pretty the neat. Painting, those are pretty cool. A little bit. They, it, it was weird. They almost did a Saul Bass kind of thing at first, but then they moved away from it. I think the very opening had some Saul Bass. Kind a of, little bit. But then yeah. it was, yeah, it got a bit more sketchy looking. I, yeah, I liked that. But then, you know what? You know what should have been our first clue that this is going to be weird mm. is from the opening credits where we get these cool stop motion paintings. There's an iris like wipe to the convention center that this that art i always forget art bezel basil <laughs> which is a i feel like it's the sundance of the art world okay i had no idea what this was that's i'm not in tune with the art world i it, i i i always read about this every year because i'm fascinated by stories that come out of it because it's kind of like a you know, like celebrities go there and stuff to to be pretentious and it I don't know. It's it's such a world that I find totally alien and fascinating, and I have zero desire to ever go to this ever. But I've only ever read about it, so I realized I have no idea how to pronounce Art Basel, Basel, Basel. <laughs> but yes, I said it's the most insufferable place I've never been, and probably won't be. That was my note. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we get an iris wipe from the credits to this convention center, and I that made me like, oh, uh, it was a weird. Uh, <laughs> I know. Oh, I feel I like I'm watching a, a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this that's the thing is it opens with, and this is when I can see the Altman comparisons because there is like this kind of uh, even almost a, a um, um, fuck, West Wing. Uh, uh, Walking and talking? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's kind of that as Jake Gyllenhaal who is Mort. Morph. Uh, Morph, I'm sorry. Yeah, what the morph? I accidentally typed Worf a bunch at first. Worf? Yeah. Like the Star Wars character? Star Trek, yeah. Star- oh, that's right, Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> morph Vanderwalt, who is an art critic, mm-hmm. and he's walking around, he's, he's talking to people, and like it's like, okay, that's fine. But like the score, which is done by Mel- Marco Beltrami, who's a huge horror composer he did all the scream movies he worked with Wes Craven a ton okay he he is a constantly working horror composer and he the score is very uh uh whimsical and kind of like jaunty and I was like okay is this the tone we're going for and maybe it was but I don't think this movie ever landed on a tone no Uh, because yeah this opening scene makes it feel more lighthearted and satirical than a lot of what the end, the rest of the movie ends up being. 
Yeah. You know, because yeah. he's like walking around talking to people being like, oh, uh, and, and yeah, we're getting this like kind of a critique of the artist critic where he's insulting this like hobo man. Robo which, hobo. You had a much better name. That's robo hobo. better name. I, w- I was looking at the hashtag Velvet Buzzsaw, Buzzsaw on Twitter and someone else also had the idea for it. I think a lot of people watching this. It's right there, but yeah. It's right there. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a difficult joke to make, but <laughs> I also didn't realize that our... Bazell, I'm just calling it that. I sure. don't care if Let's it's just wrong. Stick with that. Art Bazell takes place in a convention center, like fucking Comic Con. Oh, it yeah. looked like VidCon in there. Oh, where else are you gonna put it? I guess I just <laughs> always imagined it being in such well-appointed galleries. Mm. Yeah, uh, but I found that kind of funny. Uh, yeah, so he Jake Gyllenhaal's walking around and, and looking at all the art, and he we, doesn't like Hobo Man. He does not like Robo Hobo. It's yeah. Um, it is yeah it's actually called Hobo Man and he tells the creator to his face that it's not original there was something exactly like it a couple of years figure, ago man. yeah blah blah and then this guy is kind of still like well hey can you can you at least do like a, a decent review of this because it's going to affect sales and so Jake Gyllenhaal just kind of brushes him off and walks away. Yeah, so that's J- Jake Gyllenhaal is an art critic whose uh, reviews severely affect sales of things yeah what was the what was the movie we just saw where there's like uh, from a few years ago oscar movie with the reviewer uh is it birdman we're like oh the, yeah birdman yeah, yeah, where, yeah where he meets with her in a bar mm-hmm. and i think she's like straight up i'm gonna pan this show yeah yeah I, yeah I like movies that have like go into the power of critics oh yeah even though i'm not sure how much weight that holds nowadays at least with movies probably with art it's different mm-hmm. but with movies people are like rotten tomatoes yeah i don't know if the movie critic has as much power as they used to especially since we get all of our information from so many different sources now yeah think back when we have the heyday of roger ebert and i think probably the one holdout from back then is like leonard malton (laughs) or something (laughs) yeah but they that's when you read the newspaper for your reviews and you've got your your movie critic Mm -hmm. and that's the opinion you trust but i could see the art world still being like that oh yeah absolutely music critics too i think is Hmm. yeah i think music magazines are still i don't really know though much about the music world but there's another big old art piece sphere yeah which is like the chicago bean kind of remind me of the bean or the phantasm sentinel yes it looks like the phantasm ball and it was weird because you also part of this exhibit is it's a big big silver sphere and you put your arm in it and like you feel different sensations in there it's purposely kind of vague yeah an Um, old woman walks away being like i haven't felt like that in years yeah (laughs) yeah she got her i don't know her hand vagina like yeah i don't know it sounded very sexual i was like what's going on in there yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh but i thought it was funny that in in phantasm there is the old lady who has him put his hand in the box and he feels stuff and oh yeah so it's kind of like a weird mashup of these phantasm Mm -hmm. elements i don't know if that was even on purpose but probably not yeah (laughs) so um john malkovich shows up immediately immediately his first line has fuck Fuck. in it which i appreciated (laughs) he's also a uh recovering alcoholic yes who's fighting to not drink Yeah, yeah, yeah um we meet uh jake oh oh my god i <laughs> i misspelled like j-a-k-e as j-a-k-k-e which i thought was just another character in this no i'm still talking about jake <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> lots of typos in these notes um yeah so okay we're gonna meet a bunch of fucking characters so hold on there's so many so renee russo is uh uh art she like owns the art gallery she's a yeah she's a gallery owner a curator okay. cool and, and she, so what's yeah her name? Uh, uh, Ro- rodora rodora got yeah. it yeah so cool. art galleries art galleries are weird and i never i feel like i i never understood kind of what they do until i was a bit older because i i truly never understood the extent to which the art world is a it's it's rich people collectors and that's it there's no and i think you know that's what this movie is trying to get at is it's not art for art's sake it's not art for the masses an art gallery is a misleading term it's not a museum this is a gallery where that's the stuff they're selling yeah that's the thing is that uh like i said i am very not plugged into the art world i've never been like that kind of artist and so this movie i was a bit confused on the i guess uh 
relationship dynamics and the power dynamics between the different characters and the different roles that they have. I think I have a better, like, I, I think I Because, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure, especially Tony Collette's character who mm-hmm. leaves one position and begins another, who, who, who yeah. tries to make herself another Renee Russo, I think. Another, like, no. no? She, See, yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So she, she was working at a, um, okay, so Renee Russo, Owns a gallery, I believe. The Hayes Gallery. The Hayes that's Gallery. Her last name. Tony Collette is another buyer, curator type person, and I believe she was she was working for a gallery, and she's just left to become a buyer for a private client. So okay. just some rich person who we never meet. We never meet yeah, them, but it's it's a, a rich person, okay. and she's saying that's where the money is because you have a singular super wealthy client that's Got gonna it. buy your shit, and she. So her client buys the bean? The um, sphere? I forget. <laughs> I know Sphere ends up in her gallery at some point. So I believe so, yes. Okay. I think what happens is her client buys it. But no, it's it. not her gallery. No, it's, it's not hers. Yeah. It's the one that she used to work at. And she goes to them and says, hey, here, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you display this stuff, blah, 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 before it goes to my private buyer to just never be seen again, which Got is what it. happens with all this art. Okay. I was literally, there was an article that was kind of going viral on Twitter a couple weeks ago, maybe, where it was in Fortune magazine. And this was the most eat the rich shit I've ever seen. It was an article. What? Eat the rich. Oh. (laughs) It was an article about how. rich people have a concern of theirs like something that this is a rich rich people problem hashtag they damage their art that they buy because they pop champagne and they have corks flying to it (laughs) actual article i think on fort in fortune magazine yeah so that's what happens to so so much art is it just disappears and rich people hoard it and put it on their boats or whatever if you read crazy rich asians which we read the book there's Mm -hmm. a lot of that and they don't really go into that in the movie but in the book they all these characters own picassos and shit and they just put them on their boats or in their kids bedroom oh yeah because the end of that uh like one of the the rich ladies who has like a religious revival is destroying all this art like has all this priceless art art, but she becomes a born again christian Mm -hmm. and just destroys all of this art that is based to her eyes is heathen art yeah and i know it was a, it's a fictional book and i was still dying <laughs> yeah okay so that's tony collette uh who by the way looking great in this movie i good, just gotta say she's she's rocking this like bob it's, and it's like white it looks silver really hair good on her it looks great on her yeah it's a good look love it tony collette is doing her thing in this Reminding us all that she was robbed <laughs> this robbed. year at the Academy Not Awards. Not even goddamn nominated. We meet David Diggs, who's an artist. Yep. Uh, Damrish? Damrish? Who, yeah, and he's like, you kind of get the feel that he's uh, uh, a up-and-comer artist who he just left a cooperative. Yes. That like wasn't as much focused on profit, just like art, man. Yep, art for art's sake. Cool. Again, he his character and the idea of art for art's sake and collectives, man, reminds me of another better movie to go watch is Basquiat. Just go watch that. Oh, okay. With, uh, about the artist Basquiat, David Bowie is in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's a good movie. Go watch it. <laughs> uh, David Diggs feels a little stilted in this movie. And yeah. I don't know if it's like the role or what, but or maybe it's just him adjusting to screen performances, which is severely different, different mm-hmm. than stage performances. I don't know if he's had any other movie roles or much experience. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a much different, just cause if, you, if you're not familiar, like think about it. when you're on the stage, it is a unbroken uh, performance where you get in character, you go out there, you give that performance to a uh, en- uh, audience whose energy you're feeding off of. Dude, mm-hmm. with movies and film uh, like TV, it's a totally different thing. It's why you watch the old old movies, silent movies, especially even early talkies. The acting in them, we it's 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 why it's such an easy style to make fun of because it's so big. But that's what acting was. Yeah, we didn't have this idea of acting for the camera, and it's it's so different because you have to wait for the setups, the lights, and the cameras, and then you'll just do a couple of lines at one angle and then they stop and you have to like get back into mm-hmm. character a half hour later it's hard. It's, it's very hard it's hard but uh i was glad to see him because he's one of my favorite parts yeah, of, I, of the hamilton soundtrack i was happy to see him too mm-hmm. yeah very subdued compared to jefferson <laughs> yeah. but yeah so he he's talking to redora again the curator lady and she she we learned that she has a past as this punk 
singer and she's in a punk band and she has a tattoo that's it's velvet buzzsaw we learned that that's the name of her it's band a buzzsaw and it blade was, on the back of her it, neck. yes she's got cool. this tat um great great yeah, John Malkovich, we meet him, he's Piers, and he's, he's an artist. He's who, a Jackson Pollock, maybe. I would I'm trying to think of um just more famous or uh like more accessible artists to compare these character types to oh, for okay. people who haven't to get kind of an idea of the cast that we're sure dealing with here. Well, the the big thing with him is that uh everyone thinks that he his art sucks ever since he's been sober. Exactly. Which is a common thing with artists and writers and musicians. And They're just super sad. If you know someone who's recovering from alcoholism don't, don't say don't they used to be more fun better. or anything, yeah. or anything or like, anything they were more don't do that yeah that's not good man. <laughs> but that's why i bring up jackson pollock is oh. he was an alcoholic and a lot of yeah that was present in his art also mm-hmm. the movie pollock <laughs> also very good <laughs> go watch that uh anyone else oh yeah josephina who is that actress who uh at the top i said i didn't know zawe ashton yeah uh she we meet her as she's getting broken up with by her boyfriend Mm -hmm. uh she's getting dumped yeah so she's kind of a mess that he's cheating on her and And she is she works for redora at redora's gallery Mm -hmm. Mm uh yep oh and uh, oh but she also since she comes in late she gets called out by handyman slash artist wannabe oh, uh bryson yeah. played by billy magnuson, magnuson yeah. how do you know this guy because i you mean said you recognized him. yeah he's in a bunch of stuff i think he might have done musical yeah i think he was musical well he was theater, rapunzel's he also, prince he's in, rapunzel's prince into, into the, the woods. woods i think also a musical theater person he's about to be an aladdin he is about to be an aladdin yes uh but yeah so that guy's on a ladder and he's another character to know yeah and he's kind of um talking himself up like i don't because he's putting together this exhibit like he's hired to be a handyman and he's like look i'm also an artist too Mm -hmm. and the way that he kind of names name drops his art makes it sound like he has had a piece that was maybe successful because he said oh i did uh, it was something with fruit loops um that's what he said he was like i glued all the fruit loops like uh, oh yeah imagine those those portraits made of candy or whatever of celebrities he did some piece like that that it sounds like was it did well and was received well so i think maybe he's a kind of take on people the, you know how the art world can chew someone up and spit them out like oh you have one great piece and then what yeah yeah so he's doing kind of just labor in galleries and stuff he also seems like a dick <laughs> oh the character yeah. <laughs> um we learn that morph and josephine were in a relationship apparently Mm -hmm. and so now that they're both single because i guess morph broke up with his boyfriend well morph has this boyfriend so yeah he's a bisexual apparently yeah uh or fluid in some way and we get to see his boyfriend's man ass oh that's right yeah we get man ass there's a few there's some we also get to see jake gyllenhaal's man ass yeah and jake gyllenhaal is ripped oh yeah it's and, and I guess he's been this he's way for been a while. Ripped, yeah, because I, I always just think of him as Bubble Boy. I know oh he's my not God, he's not Bubble Boy too. anymore. Oh, bubble he is boy. a he is a man. Yeah. And I, do you find him attractive? Yeah. Okay. But it's weird because I never found him attractive back in the day when he was kind of this teen idol, and that was when he's doing Donnie Darko and shit. Oh, yeah. And he was not my type because mm-hmm. he he's a very soft boy. He has very soft, sweet features, and <laughs> I remember like I I really liked him when I, I went and saw Brokeback Mountain in theaters, but Heath was my, you know, I had, the, I had a big crush on Heath Ledger. If I had to pick one of the two, but you're either a Heath or you're a Jake. <laughs> oh, yeah. Keith that uh, generational <laughs> dispute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think then he went and did Prince of Persia, maybe, and then just stayed ripped as fuck. <laughs> He's very fit. And so I think grizzled, crazy Jake Gyllenhaal is when I'm finding him attractive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh he also seems just like a smart dude. I, I I was listening to some interview with him, I think, on NPR. And he, yeah, he seems like he's a very intelligent guy, the way he talks about screenplays and, and acting. And he he's someone, I think, who has very good understandings of all the texts that he's working with. And he picks cool stuff. And he, you know. I feel like he's the good version of Jared Leto. Yes. Right? I totally see it. Right? Yeah, that makes sense to me. That okay. might just make sense to the two of us, but I get it. <laughs> oh my God, him over Jared Leto any day, any time. 
So yeah, now uh, they rekindle their relationship. Yeah, since. and he he like goes in to stick his fingers up her back. He like puts his hand between her legs, and there's an airplane sound <laughs> as his hands going on there. Yeah, it's like a transition to a different great. scene, but yeah, mm-hmm. more creative edits movie. Come on, <laughs> that was so great, and we never topped it. <laughs> Um, Josephine is leaving her apartment building uh, after all this goes down and she sees a cane on the floor. It's kind of in the lobby. She It's like this big open atrium. And she looks up and she sees an old man laying on the floor a few floors above her. She goes up to investigate and it's this old dude who's just fallen down and is unconscious. So she calls an ambulance. and He did. He's dead. Yeah, he did. And yeah, the the people who are tending to him are like, yeah, because she she noticed a cat in his apartment. She asks after the cat, like, what's going to happen to him? Uh, We'll come get the cat after we destroy all the stuff in his apartment as per his wishes. So this old guy died, has no family or anything, but the uh, paramedics or whatever mention that all of the stuff in his apartment has to be destroyed. So while she's go while she's like walking around, she hears that cat again mm-hmm. and goes into the apartment just to like, hey kitty, and finds all the stuff that is meant to be destroyed. It's all this artwork. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty cool artwork. Ah oh, damn, we don't have the picture that you made oh, of me, yeah. the oil painting. Yeah. Shit. I did I, I did art in high school. I did AP art. Like I was I was gonna go to art school. Yeah, Chelsea's and an did artist. not I do I love oil pastels. I made James an old pastel portrait for Christmas. Yeah. We'll have to go grab it and I'll post it on my Instagram. By the okay. time you're listening or watching this, it'll be on my Instagram. Okay. Check okay. it out. But my personal one, James A. Jennings. Yeah, I like yeah, so this guy's got a lot of it looks like pastel. Um, it could be kind of canvas paper. We got some oil paintings and stuff. It's all very um creepy maybe some goya vibes where it's like really morbid goya is like the dude who is getting like heads ripped off in his art and it's like yeah it's really dark cool shit um (laughs) but we we get something is off right away and she's looking around and we can tell she's thinking there's some potential here this is a ton of art and it's the classic story of the artist that no one recognizes during their life and they die and become famous after they're dead. And you can tell that that's kind of what's going on in her head. And apparently this character is based on an, uh, a real person who there's a documentary about this guy I've never seen, but I'm dying to watch it now that there was a, a guy who he was a, a janitor and made all this art and died and, and became famous after he died and was kind of, positioned as outsider art the actual man's art looks very different than what's in this movie um but there was all kinds of um mystery surrounding this dude and rumors about him being um either like a murderer or something like that oh really yeah i'm oh I'm, okay i'm not entirely sure because i haven't seen the documentary but i, I want to go watch it um i don't remember what it's called but yeah so this is based in some some truth um yep but, but it also did, is like a Vincent Van Gogh thing. You hear this story so many times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she discovers this art, by the way, after Rodora fires her. That's cr- for, Yes, that's for important. For always being late. Yeah, she's late. Well, because her stupid boyfriend was cheating on her and some other shit. So she shows up late to work. And Rodora is... Oh, I just got like... I feel, I've had <laughs> bosses like Rodora before. And it made me feel so... I don't know. I got like just like hot under the collar yeah she's just like one of those power people power yeah like uh yeah alpha type boss yeah no not no no empathy yeah Mm -hmm. just ugh. so um i don't she she doesn't fire her she's like just get your you need to get your shit together okay yeah yeah it's it's basically a warning like last strike before you're gone so then josephine is using this art she finds as a this is her key back in and her way to make good but um she she decides to keep it all to herself. I think this is maybe not even her way back in. It's more like her revenge. She's going to prove her value by keeping this to herself. And she's going to make a big move as Jeff Probst (laughs) would say in the art world. (laughs) Um, The artist Piers, John Malkovich. Now I understand. I, my note is Piers has left Rodora for Don, John Don Don. I have no idea what any of this means. And now I do that. I've seen the whole movie. Yeah. John Don Don. Uh, John John Don Don is John, a yeah. rival curator. Yeah. To he's Rodora. a rival gallery owner. Gallery owner. Yeah. 
And I guess I'm sure we're using all these terms wrong, but whatever. Yep. He own, he owns a physical space where he sells art from. He's a gallery owner, sure, like Rodora. And yeah, John Malkovich has left Rodora to go on the John Don Don. John Don Don. Uh, yeah, that John Don Don train. Yeah, oh, I thought you were gonna rhyme. I was trying, dude. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, Josephine. Oh my God. I'm. <laughs> my notes are. I feel. I think I'm behind you. Is the problem? I'm looking and I'm like, oh God, we're jumping all over the place. This movie jumps around yeah, a bit. It's because there's. It's because it. there's so many characters. Um, I do have here that. Well, one, there's a kitty cat jump scare, which is great. It's in the apartment when she's looking for the paintings. Probably the only jump scare you give a shit about in this. <laughs> um, but I also have that the the director is. I do, I do like his chemistry with Jake Gyllenhaal. He's good at having Jake Gyllenhaal be a total creep, and he wasn't the biggest fan of Gyllenhaal's performance here. It wasn't my favorite, but I do like that this director is able to like, you know, Make get him, him weird. to yeah. yeah. I don't know. Much more fun in Nightcrawler. Yeah, here it felt like trying to be weird, kind of. Yeah, I don't know. I felt like he he got the note that his character was bisexual, and then went too hard like lean too hard into what he thought that would be maybe sure because i don't know i'd be curious to see what people um think of this character because i've seen both opinions on it that it's it's cool that we have a bisexual main character where that's not the point of the movie and he just is yeah it's not even like Um, a focal point or anything yeah Yeah. but there are some moments where he is talking to josephine and saying you make me feel very confused and Hmm. it's so i don't know i'm it's not my place that to to be more like uh, i don't know right because if i i kind of read it as oh is he because i thought he was gay at first and i was like oh is he I, 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 I thought the conf- confusion he was expressing was maybe having to do with like settling down as opposed to I like see. uh sexual attraction and sexual identity but i see who knows I mean, yeah I, I i'm i'm interested to see other people's thoughts on that character yeah i think it's more interesting that like when these two he he seems to feel more for her than she for him oh, but absolutely. even when they're talking to each other it <laughs> and uh, this is purposeful it's like they're talking past each other yes. like they're not really responding to what the other person says and i feel like you know that's like oh these people are shitty this movie's full of shitty people it's just all shitty people which is fine if, if your movie's full of shitty people you gotta have a good movie otherwise i i love movies about shitty people yeah if it's done well yeah I can watch a whole anything of shitty people and I love it. I honestly tend to love things where all the characters suck. <laughs> um, but yeah, you gotta, it's, it's hard to, to pull off. Cause if, if you don't pull it off, then you're just wasting my time and make me, making me watch shitty people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like that. He uses the word ensorcelled. Yes. Yeah, cause, cause Josephine shows him a portfolio full of, uh, the, uh, the dead artist is named Deese. He's vessel. Vetral. Vetral Deese. Yes, or which D's. we had hoped would be a 90-minute lead-up to a D's Nuts D's joke. D's Nuts joke, and then the movie ends. It's not even, it's it's two hours long, dude. It's like 120 minutes. I know, but we only meet D's 20 minutes in. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I know. I was hoping it would be one of those long, winding jokes until it ends with a D's Nuts pun. And yeah, it's like Jake end. Gyllenhaal is like lying on the floor dying, and he's like, get me D's, and the paramedics are like, who's D's? And he's like, D's nuts. nuts and dies. That's how the <laughs> movie should have ended. Mm-hmm. Better movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, she shows him a big portfolio of Deez's stuff. And Jake John Hall says, I'm ensorcelled, which yeah. is a great. Is that a real word? I don't know, but I, I want to start it using it. And <laughs> yeah, that might have been my one of my favorite lines on this. It's a, that's a great word to use. Yeah. Because yeah. like you, even if you've never heard it before, you know what you it means. Ensorcelled. And that's the, that's the key, uh, by the way. I heard this once before to like the best use of vocabulary is using a word that someone wouldn't use but would understand. Mm, okay. So it's not a word that like you say it and they're like, what does that mean? You say it, and within the context and just how it sounds, oh, someone's man. like, "I get what you're saying. I would have never put it that way." Slight, slight tangent, but I was just <laughs> watching the newest Salad Fingers. Um, I'm a big David Firth fan, and he just did another chapter of Salad Fingers. And what makes that series so funny to me and so like well written is he does that exact 
thing is he's making something that's really weird without leaning into words that we use to describe weird things that are overused. His use of vocabulary is so good in those, and he's constantly using phrases and stuff that I would not expect to be used. But that you understand. But that I get and that I just think are so funny. Like, it's so, it'd be easy to write a thing like salad fingers and lean into overused creepy words. I always think of moist. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Redora is in the middle of setting up this exhibit. I I liked this this shot and this cut. We we cut to this. Um, it's like a family room. It reminds me of a family Matilda, which I don't think you've seen in a while. Yeah, but it, it's it's a family where they're on the couch watching the Powerball lottery, and at first you think it's real people. It it feels like you're you're looking at a different movie at first, and you get this wide shot of this living room. It reminded me of the fucking rabbits in Inland Empire that like David Lynch, oh, yeah, <laughs> where they're just in a living room doing stuff. But you're just looking at this living room with a family on a couch, and they're just sitting completely still, and the you realize. TV and stuff yeah you realize they're wax figures or something and then Rodora walks in and she's adjusting the lighting and stuff and i thought that little cut was clever i wanted more fun uses of art pieces yeah especially because she's like huh it felt more uh like uh uh yeah it was more it felt more uh effective it felt yeah yeah like more effective under a different setting yeah Mm. when she back when she purchased it yeah 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 um I, yeah, th- that's another thing that I think is so frustrating about about this is there's so much you can do with art exhibits, performance art, even um, installations where you can make those scary. I like the lot. The family watching the lottery is so creepy to me. And bring that, that back. I know. Cause here, okay. Cause I, we got to get through this movie. Cause there's so, it's a long movie. There's a lot of shit. I know. I we, have so many thoughts about, yeah, about it. but I'm just saying spoiler alert. Art starts to kill people. Bring back this fucking family exhibit. Bring back have the these creepy people, wax family. Yeah, yeah. Have them kill something. You know, cause we get to see hobo man again later. And that's one of the, that's one of the most of the effective. Movie. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. And like sphere. Yeah. Does okay. Job. We won't, we won't go, like because this movie's long and we won't go through in every single beat um i think it'll be more fun if we kind of talk about it more broadly <laughs> now that i'm actually discussing it yeah so so art um basically through through Deez's stuff Deez's art is haunted and we we see it move and stuff we see some eyeballs move and and they don't look good it looks bad man the the one time i thought it looked fine and it wasn't the cgi i just thought it was an effective way they they kind of conveyed the idea that art was moving was in the apartment where oh. there's a cut like we see a portrait and it's staring forward and there's a cut and we notice in another cut its eyes are looking in a different place okay and stuff like that is so much more effective to me than actually seeing it move because when you see this art move it looks like shit yeah <laughs> it looks like someone did a little warp filter and <laughs> it's ah man it's bad it's yeah. cgi and yeah, it's, it's so it's, obviously it's, cgi that it's it takes me right out of it and it's that's why i'm saying is you could use so many other types of art that aren't paintings so you don't have to rely on so you don't have to rely you can do practical stuff and and do things with practical like installations like they keep walking by this creepy horse in uh i think john dondon's gallery he's got this like like horse made out of metal sheets and stuff and you could have that be a giant scary puppet and shit and yeah there's so many more things you could do that aren't cgi because it made me the the paintings all moving made which they do a lot made yeah. me think of uh uh it with yeah. the woman and like that's the worst looking effect in that movie it is but it's i mean she's creepy it's still it's a fun scare sure and that's another thing too is even though, yeah, that is the, I think, the the worst looking effect in that movie, the way that sequence is shot is so effective yeah. that I'm willing to forgive the kind of weird CGI in that. But this movie does not do any of that deliberate timing, framing, anything to set me up for a good scare. No, and the few times it attempts to, it fails. Like, it's, uh, it just, like gas station. Yeah, it just and, lands with a God, thud, man. Station. And it makes me wonder if I'm even, if is this a horror movie? That's the thing. And like, we're the last people to gate, <laughs> yes. gatekeep horror movies. Because speaking of it, that was such an issue I had was when people were saying, it's not even a horror movie. I'm like, yes, it is. It's, it's very horror, clearly It's is. a horror movie. Yeah. Even though it's funny and it's a lot of fun, it's still a horror movie. 
this is one where I'm like, is it a horror movie? I don't it, know. It really feels because like it's it's billed and advertised, at least as far as I've seen, a as horror a horror movie. movie. Yes. On Netflix, in the Wikipedia description, whatever, it's it says horror movie. This was movie. sold as a horror movie and Nightcrawler was not. No. I don't believe so. It was a, a thriller, thriller, yeah. Which we said earlier felt more like a horror movie. Better I, horror movie. I yeah. think the problem with this is that uh he's making this movie and he forgets that it's a horror movie until there are these little sequences when he's like, oh yeah, like when John Don Don dies. And it's this weird, oh. and it's a boring, it's so like boring. really rote, like cheaply constructed horror sequence where it f- feels like, oh yeah, this is a horror movie. So let's have this like creepy and then we'll cut when it something jumps out at yeah it. and it just feels like really dude like we've seen this and it's not good yeah i i guess i'll yeah to kind of explain why that sequence and basically any any scare sequence in this just for me fails so hard is I mean, like another great tony collette movie hereditary <laughs> like that movie, even if maybe you, if I watched it again, I bet I would be surprised at how sparse the scares actually are and like the jump scares and stuff. Because I don't think there's that many. But that movie, the atmosphere is so fucking intense that you are never comfortable during that thing. Every single moment you feel like something is going to happen. And it's amazing. This movie, you never feel that. You feel like you're watching, again, kind of like a network dramedy. Yeah, there's never that atmosphere. Until the atmosphere just switches to a kind of mediocre horror movie where you're expecting a scare because... And it's too telegraphed. Yeah, because you see it coming from a mile away. There are no surprises in this at all. I'm never sitting there watching Jake Gyllenhaal and Josephine in in her apartment and thinking, oh my God, something has to happen right now. I'm so scared. But no, it's just them sitting and talking. Yeah, I think it's Josephina. Josephina. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But but yeah, no, you're right. It, the the feelings you have in this movie while watching it are either bored or oh, this is a horror part, quote unquote. Like this is what's supposed to be a horror part. Yeah. It's a bummer. Yeah. Uh oh yeah, also yeah, Natalia Dyer from Stranger Things is here. Yeah, <laughs> being a character that I don't She is one of uh, th- at least 3 characters who could probably get cut. Yeah. You, you don't need John Malkovich and David Diggs. No. Because they, they both, both end up fulfilling the same purpose. Kind of. Yeah. They're both. I, I almost think it'd be more interesting to like have one of them play the other and then just, yeah, get rid of one of them and maybe even have David Diggs play the John Malkovich role, <laughs> even though I love John Malkovich. But like, yeah, you only, the John Malkovich character is more effective than the David Diggs character. Definitely. Yeah. Because the John Malkovich character and his ending the end of his story is the point of the movie which is art for for, personal sake for art's sake making making art for for yourself art not for profit yeah because he's kind of the only one who makes it out alive well him and davy Diggs, Diggs, yeah and i guess natalia yeah she gets out she moves back to michigan she does she moves back to michigan (laughs) from michigan but yeah there's there's like it was her what's the point of her being it was funny though because watching her character like She's 22 in this. She's 22 in real life, but she says she's 22 and her going to interviews and just the way that she like she just seems constantly nervous. And and I was like, fuck, I, that that's how you. I felt. Because you were 22 when you came out here. I was, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> yep, that is exactly what it's like being 22 working anywhere around people who are leaders in art or film or it just constantly being nervous you're gonna get yelled at but and her- trying to interview for jobs you're not qualified <laughs> for <laughs> but her character is like nakedly uh just for plot purposes because she's the one who just like will overhear information and then bring it and to another tell it to character someone else. that's all she's around and for. She, then she's the one who discovers each dead body which yeah. i couldn't tell if it was supposed to be Funny? I think it, I think the last one is because she screams and then she's she says something like "Come on, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, like a real Joe Bluth, come on, yeah," of like Which, discovering the fourth dead body. That could be so funny, and it's just not. Yeah, like <laughs> settle on that tone if you're gonna do that. Yeah, uh, I guess the big thing, the next big thing since we left off the beat by beat is Billy Magnuson. 
uh, is supposed to take all the work to an art uh, warehouse to to make it seem more rare and drive up the price. Yes, but, which I guarantee is a thing that happens. Oh, they're sure. de- they're de beersing the shit. They're Hell doing. Yeah. They're making the stuff into diamonds, dude. But yeah. the the paintings start to come to life in his truck, and then what? It crashes his car. He like yeah, he crashes his car into a gas station. Oh, after like lighting himself on fire with uh, cigarette embers. Uh, yeah, the paint like goes up. And he crashes into a gas station that says humble on the sign because that's supposed to mean something, probably. Is that a real gas station? I don't no, know. No, it's probably it just like... It looks like some shit you would find driving through the hills, though. There is, like, I think of that one. I think it's on Coldwater. There's, like, that little market that's just in the hills. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then he goes into the gas station bathroom to, like, uh, to take care of his wounds. Sequence, and there's man. a fucking painting in the bathroom yeah. of monkeys fixing a car. First of all... I don't understand what this building is. I hope someone can explain it to me. Where, yeah. Is it? Is it? Is it real? Do it's they real. own it? No. Do they? Because why is there an actual painting in there? I don't know. I think it's a random gas station that he happened with to be an by actual with an actual painting in the of bath. monkeys fixing yes. a car, which and is a good. It's a good painting. <laughs> I like it. It's a lot. not a D's painting though. No. But for some reason, it still comes alive. Well, that's gonna uh, everything is coming to life in this because the I silver guess cause the sphere, sphere and the graffiti D's. at the end. Sure, yeah. So art. I guess art is out to kill. It's the happening with art. Art's coming to get you. Which is ya. a better movie. Uh, not the happening itself. I haven't seen that, but the happening with, with art, art is a better movie than <laughs> sure. this. Uh, but yeah, the monkeys grab him, and then he's he's gone. He's yeah. disappeared. Here's the thing. They they get they send these pictures to get analyzed or whatever by a paint uh oh, scientist yeah. oh my who gosh. is played by a woman who was on Sesame Street yeah, for she eight was years. On Ses- that's that's cool. like her and that's what she's known for. She was one of the actual people on Sesame Street and one of the humans that lives on on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, she's uh, like a restorer or like a chemist and I ooh, this is this is one of the jobs in the art world that I think would be so cool to have and it is one that I find the most fascinating. I I follow a lot of restorers on twitter and instagram because it is such a neat job and one i think would be really cool but also really terrifying um i think philip mold m-o-u-l-d is one i follow on twitter if you want to watch someone uh restore paintings and and show befores and afters and you can watch him like rub away the dirt it's oh it's so good (laughs) but it's it's really cool I've, i've learned a lot about art history through that account but she she is analyzing this painting by taking little tiny chips off it and running like spectrum tests on it and stuff and she's like there's something weird about it and then an hour later and in this fucking movie an hour later. we find out oh his blood was in the paint reveal that shit no immediately way, cause, cause we already knew by time you said it yeah cause the painting's kind of bleeding cause we learn a while before that too that Dee at some point kills his abusive father yeah we get the backstory on Dee's. so we're like alright there's bodies in the paint in the paint and we like yeah, they should just reveal that. <laughs> oh, I didn't. Sure. Yeah. That would have been his dad's blood and stuff. Oh, I assumed it was his own. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It'd be great if the movie told us. It would be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's another information that Rodora learns and that uh, uh, Coco, Nat- Natalia D- Dyer's character, over here so she can give later yeah. to, I think, John Dondon. Yeah, I do. Have re- I don't remember what part this is at, but at some point, Jake Gyllenhaal is yelling at someone, and he's like, "I further the realm I analyze," and I wrote that that's me hosting the podcast. <laughs> I further the realm I analyze. Oh, is that maybe the scene where Tony Collette? Uh, she, yes, that's right. Tony, she's trying to like get him to cut a deal with her, where he'll tell her what she's art trying to. Is. She's trying to Martha Stewart the art world. Oh, is that what Martha Stewart did? <laughs> well, she. That's insider. why she got arrested. Is insider trade. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Because she wants, uh, she wants Morph to tell her what reviews he's or he's he, gonna do. He's going to give before he publishes, so them. that she can sell them at a higher price or buy them. Buy, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones that will become. And valuable. he says, "Are he? <laughs> it's great. He uh gives her a a what for? Where he's just like, look, lady, 
I take my job seriously, thank you. My yeah. reviews are art in themselves, and I take pride in them, which I, yeah, I liked that. Yeah, and she's scene. like, oh, so Rodora's just prescient. And later, you find out that his ex-boyfriend yeah. was giving information to Rodora about his upcoming reviews. And there's an angle I'd rather see more explored than what? two fucking lines. God, I would love to see more of a... Weirdly, it made me think of Nightcrawler again because that movie is all about um, like learning where the next hot story is going to be and the lengths people go to to find the next big thing and be on site for the next thing that's going to happen or, and you know, inevitably creating things that are going to happen. Yeah. And I would love a movie where it's people, it's, yeah, maybe resorting to murder to uh, manipulate the art market. And oh, like stuff. a bucket of blood. <laughs> Well, yeah, okay, like a bucket <laughs> of blood, but you know what I mean. Is, yeah, is that the the cutthroat world of of trading and stuff where there's all that backstabbing and shit? Like that would be, yeah, you're so right. That would be more fun to explore. Yeah, and there's also that other angle where Josephina wants uh uh morph to write a bad review of her ex's uh art exhibit because he's doing an art exhibit. And he does, he does, even though he says that he liked it and he starts to get shit for writing that bad review. And yeah, it's another angle where it's it gets like four or five lines of dialogue total. Yeah, because that's an interesting thing, too. And it's it's so interesting in this because we barely do anything with it. But the the amount of responsibility Jake Gyllenhaal has and the amount of power where he because he writes a bad review of Josephine's Josephina's ex yeah and he's so upset by it that he gets in a car crash and is now in a coma which is like a kind of a two-line throwaway and this haunts jake gyllenhaal to the point where he starts hallucinating at some exhibit where it's like a sound exhibit an immersive sound thing and he hears all of his bad reviews being read back out loud to him through these speakers and that's like interesting if it's not surface level like it's, it is it's such a here there's so thing. many i think that, like yeah. just trim down on the characters and hone in maybe more like don't on, like stop trying to make a robert altman movie yeah 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 because i'm curious like i'm interested in this this story about an art critic who's like at the top of his game and uh is realizing the power of his reviews and the power maybe you know uh, his reviews of this w work that he finds has a supernatural deadly effect and his responsibility to that. It's really good art, but it's killing people. What do I do? Like that's a, that's something to explore yeah, and see play out. Yeah. But instead we get scenes like John Don Don getting killed, which as we've talked about are just this telegraphed horror sequence, yeah. which ends with something jumping Ooh, out at him. It's a hand pops out and it, and it cuts to black and then you see uh natalia dyer walk in the next day and he's hanging from the ceiling yeah. and she screams yeah yeah oh boy um you know kind of jokes i i feel like maybe would have been i feel like maybe they're a bit overplayed where there's a uh, don Nunn goes to john malkovich's place and he thinks that a pile of garbage on the floor is the art piece and it's like yeah. okay he no you know that's a bunch of trash bags yeah and that joke's been done before yeah yeah i do like that malkovich just has this fucking basketball hoop Oh, set yeah. up in his giant warehouse that looked fun yeah it's like the inside of fucking the matterhorn at disneyland <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um yeah malkovich has done zero new art <laughs> like since being sober. sober yeah yeah poor guy yep and that's uh it's around here i'll i'll skip ahead even if it's not redora mm -hmm. comes over later and is like hey man go take a break like you know you're you're recuperating you're getting sober go use my beach house take some time off have fun so then john malkovich leaves is that all we see of him until the very until end until the credits yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah coco uh again natalia dyer's character she's like yeah she was working for redora then she gets fired when she accidentally lets in one of those co-op guys because he just pops in. He was like uh, David Diggs's like co-op leader mm -hmm. who pops in at random. So then she goes works for Don Don, finds him dead. At the end, she's working for Jake Gyllenhaal again. She is just a a information You're vessel, so right. she's like just there docking to... at the ports of characters yeah. and, and offlifting her cargo of information. Yeah. 
Yep. It's it's blatant. We we learn um more visits the the veterans hospital where D's worked because he learns that from a private investigator, I think. There's like a someone's doing it some fucking detective work into who Deese was and he so Morph goes and visits this veteran hospital this veterans hospital that, that Deese was a janitor at and apparently um this guy he meets a guy who worked with Deese for eighteen years and says that there was a veteran at this place who always hound like who's always on Deese's ass and hounded him was a dick towards him and one day this dude ends up dead in a field. Yeah. And so this guy's like don't don't go digging for stuff about D's. Like you just in life you would not fuck with him and he was scary. Yeah, we learn his past is kind of a weird And again, mystery. this should have come out earlier that he like he he tortured his abusive father mm-hmm. and killed him. Yeah, killed uh, this other dude. Yeah, he spent a couple decades in a mental hospital. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, Don Don gets killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do like Morph like critiquing the funeral. He just <laughs> can't help himself from when they're critiquing sitting in things. like the front row, and Morph is like, "What is this casket? <laughs> yeah, it's like, what is this color? the color? Yeah, the yeah. orange color. <laughs> Can you imagine spending eternity in this? <laughs> yeah, like that's I know. yeah. There's there's occasional moments of yeah. good stuff. Uh, yeah, him and Josephina are having sex. Yeah, they're fucking, and he gets he gets spooked because there's a deece hanging above her bed, which it feels like everyone in this movie took home a deece painting, like a giant, like a deece huge thing. one. She's got one. Redora has one at her place, and can you just do that if you? I mean, I guess if you, I don't know, man. I'm not whatever. I'm done thinking about. It. <laughs> I don't care. Uh. She knows that that Morph is still into his ex. Um, well, she thinks that she, because Tony Collette's been had been planting seeds of discord yeah. between the two of them. Yeah, we see Jake G's ass at this part. Oh yeah, you you know I don't even know if you see Josephina uh, naked, maybe a little bit during that sex scene, but you see more of Jake. There's Gyllenhaal. more manness in this than I, I don't think there's any female nudity in this. Yeah. Unless you count like in a painting, <laughs> which cool it doesn't count. <laughs> um, yep, Morph is literally going to get his eyes checked because he keeps seeing creepy shit, <laughs> which I thought was funny because he was like, "I, I got to get my eyes," and I thought he was just like he, metaphorically, yeah. But that, no, yeah. he literally goes, goes to, to an eye, eye doctor. doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, this is when he also, I guess, during this day finds out that, yep, there's blood in the paintings and stuff. Da-da. No fucking shit. Yep. Um, and this is when I write, oh my God, all the galleries in this movie look the same because I don't know who is where. It's, that's another thing with this is the lighting and, and coloring and camera and everything in this is so bland that. It's it's an issue when all of the locations look the same, which they're going to because they're all art galleries unless they're really cool buildings or some shit. But essentially, they're all these just rooms with white walls. I don't know where anyone's supposed to be half the time, and it's very confusing. There's no visual cues to tell you where you're at in this movie, and it's really, really annoying. Um, but yeah, Tony Collette is at... A, the gallery she used to she work used at, to work at, where now her client's art is going to be on display, including the sphere. The sphere, yep, and a bunch of these stuff. But the sphere is there, and she puts th- her arm in it. This is one where I, yeah, it's easier now with computers, I guess. But just thinking oh, about yeah. filming stuff with the spheres, because it's just a giant reflective ball. I'm still, I'm, I'm sure that was still really annoying to do, because you have to think. We we have to minimize as much CGI as possible. Like you want to be able. to Oh, shoot. do they? Because they don't. <laughs> I know they don't. But I'm saying you... <laughs> if you're on set with that thing, yeah, I feel like you're gonna try and think of a way to to film as much of it practically as you can. Maybe not. I don't know. But she, yeah, she sticks her arm in it, and then <sighs> at least we get uh, the sphere killing someone because it bl- cuts off her arm. But yeah, the blood that sprays out looks Bunch bad. Bunch of CGI blood And comes then when out. she falls, like the big blood spray that happens in the foreground of the camera looks really bad and cheap too. Yeah, CGI blood's never it's good. It's never good, It dude. never looks good. Nope. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> like... Man, this movie, this budget was $21 million for this. Probably for the, ca- like, I'm sure the cast costs that much money. <laughs> yeah, the cast. But come on, come but... the fuck. This does not look like it costs $21 it million. It doesn't. Dollars. No, it looks cheap. It looks really cheap. It 
if if this movie didn't have the cast it did, I think people more people would realize how bad it is. Yeah. Because it's not. Yeah, I'm shocked it has pretty positive reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. We're, we're the we're the outcasts here. Oh, I've I've seen people say it's a scathing satire of the art world. I'm like that's one where that's I my scathing like, satire. I feel like I watched a different movie. I do like though that uh, the next morning everyone thinks that her dead body is a art exhibit. Yeah, to- that Tony it's Collette's part of body. the spear. Yeah, and like kids are playing in her. Kids blood are playing and in shit. the. Okay, that that's, is that's that pretty is funny. Great. Like a school trip is just fucking playing <laughs> yeah. around in Tony Collette's blood. Like more, of, like more, like that little taste. Yeah, of like really the, the dark, dark humor. That, like that's fucked up, that's... and I want just a little, just oh, just more of that. Yeah, that, that that's is so fucking funny dark to me. And funny and These yeah, kids Coke... making like footprints and stuff with it. Is so good and then coco finding the body it, like, like after just, she had already found uh uh yeah. john don don lean into that yeah, that's funny and stop doing the moving monkey paintings <laughs> <laughs> shit god those monkeys look like shit little monkey arms popping out yeah man uh so bad. oh yeah it's around now that morph finds out that uh josephina is cheating on him with david diggs yeah and he's driving around and all he's all sad and this is a scene that reminded me of nightcrawler and made me miss <laughs> nightcrawler because it's nighttime and he's like having a, a nervous breakdown and driving around oh, super fast and i was like man i just miss nightcrawler I bet his Nightcrawler character was right there on the scene of uh, her ex-boyfriend who got in the car crash. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I bet he's the one who made it happen. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Morph calls Coco to ask her to be his assistant. And yeah, this is when she's like, if I if I fuck this up, I have to move back to Michigan. <laughs> it was too real. That character's too real for me. <laughs> Nellie Di- Dyer's fine, too. I feel like she's young. Yeah, she's young. She's young. I, yeah, I think you know. And it's a it's a character that's a, it's a nothing character. It's a nothing character. That's also true. Mm-hmm. I don't think she had much to do. No, I I this. like her. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I if <laughs> right around here, I wrote a note and then I remember deleting it because I wasn't even sure if it made sense that like the people who are all affected by the art coming alive. The first people that are really affected by it are the two artists, um, John Malkovich and David Diggs, because they're actually looking at the art and oh, yeah. they are like entranced Look, by it. Look, it makes John Malkovich drink again, which yeah. which doesn't get explored whatsoever. Yeah. And it makes it just overwhelms David Diggs. Yeah, he has to go home. He like leaves this gallery party. And I think eventually leads him to quitting Redora's gallery and going back, back to, to the cooperative. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, and so I think, oh, okay, there's something interesting that the only people who are being affected by it are people who are artists and yeah, looking like at the art. Level. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're not the people who are selling it. Yeah. And so it's, okay, so Redora is actually kind of finally looking at the art, and that's when she starts to feel the supernatural effects. But then I wasn't sure if that theory kind of fell apart later. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. But I, I like the idea that the people who are haunted by the art are the ones who are actually looking at it and enjoying the art versus someone like Josephina who is just trying to make money off it. Yeah, so Morph uh puts it together that, you know, this D's shit is causing all these uh deaths and turmoil mm-hmm. and he tells Rodora to stop selling it. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Just tells her to get rid of it all. Of course she ain't gonna do that. Nope. You got money to make. Yep. So uh yeah, this is just just when people everyone starts to die. Everyone's dying, and it's whatever. There's a hairless cat. It's cute. Oh yeah, she has a Redora has a hairless cat. Yep. But yeah, jo- Josephina. Yeah, she's in a parking lot, and this graffiti like there's a wall that starts moving behind her, and it turns into a gallery that she walks into, and she's on the phone with Redora, and the paint from the paintings in the gallery starts swirling up around her and kind of crawling up her skin and stuff. It's it's such a weird thing though because yeah, she's in this parking lot, her car is apparently blocked in cuz yeah, she's at like a CD bar kind of thing. Uh and then the the brick wall turns into an art gallery entrance yeah magically yeah and she starts to walk towards it and while she's doing that i'm looking at in the background at her car which is no longer blocked in oh really apparently i don't think it's blocked in anymore so like was it ever why doesn't she get oh, in and did leave Deuce put the car there it was a yeah. Deuce's car. especially it's 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 done so poorly because she comes out and her car's like in the very foreground and she sees it and she's like 
fuck? And we're like, what? Yeah. We don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so she goes into a magical gallery that doesn't really exist, but she still gets reception there, I guess. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, the paintings, like you said, or the graffiti melts. Yeah. And- well, it's the, it's the paintings on the walls of this gallery. They kind of start. It looks like those fucking, those shitty ass, like paintings that people make with crayons have you ever seen that where it's like you you put the crayons on top and then you melt the crayons oh, with the hair okay. dryer it always looks like garbage it'd probably be fun to do but <laughs> it's just like a shitty like print uh pinterest craft i don't know i it would pr- be satisfying to melt the crayons i guess but that's what it looks like to me since all these paintings melting and the paint crawls up her and I think it's supposed to be scary. It traps her in the wall. Yeah. Because like the, the, the storefront, the gallery yeah. front isn't really there. And then we see the reveal that she is now part of the graffiti, but it's such a weird, like... It doesn't look good. It, it lo- Yeah, one, it doesn't look good, and two, make it a more striking image for your main character to have, you know? She, you can barely see her. Yeah. I had to really She's look She's like for in her. the background of the graffiti, and I'm like, come on, like do something that is visually unsettling or or, you know give your movie a visual centerpiece for this important character that gets killed and give her like a like send her out with a bang but she's just all right i guess she's part of this graffiti and you can kind of see her cool (laughs) i guess man yeah um redora's Uh like uh she she gets rid of all the art in her home and um, all the movers are, are are moving the art out she's sitting she's wearing this all white outfit and is sitting outside on this rock and it just looks like the fucking finale of mad men she looks like don draper we're like yeah. oh shit she's gonna write the ad for coke out there <laughs> <laughs> she's sitting there like cross-legged it's an, it it's, looks it looks they just might like have, it. they might as well have filmed it on the same day she just <laughs> borrowed the outfit it's <laughs> And then, oh, while well, she sits down and, and her cat goes and sits next to her and she's sitting exactly like the, the, the painting, painting that, that she, she had. Ha- oh, cool. With and the shadows and everything. She becomes part. Oh, of- no, no, no. This is the, that's the very, very end. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, uh, I'm a- plowing ahead. No, because you're forgetting Jake Gyllenhaal. He died. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Freaking morph. I'm sorry. And <laughs> the one actually effective instance of art coming to life. In yes. Because this. this is, uh, he's. Ah, uh, he's in a storage unit. Yes. To get rid of Dees's. Yeah, he he because he yeah because they put like all the D stuff in the storage unit again to create the scarcity for oh, his yeah. work and at the funeral. So going back to that funeral from earlier, the guy who made Robo Hobo is like, hey, by the way, thanks for your shitty ass review. I had to go put Robo Hobo in a storage unit because no one wants it. Mm-hmm. Bye and. So here's so Robo-Hobo here comes Robo Hobo. He comes out of the storage unit and it's amazing it's great it's a cool character and he's saying all his little fucking catchphrases <laughs> i can't save you yeah <laughs> or like i worked on a railroad once <laughs> yeah. like, god come on velvet buzzsaw that character's so fucking weird and I cool know, I want more, more lines. of that like, and more more pieces like that because that's such a fun movie monster what like fucking robo hobo dude i love it he kills more he just kind of crushes, he crushes him. him yeah the death is kind of it's whatever. weird it's a weird death for your main care like when he died when like you get the the crack noise that universally signifies a death i was like Really? Yeah. That was Jake Gyllenhaal's death in this movie? Yeah. And jo- uh, and this, I think it happens the same night that Josephina gets all uh, mm-hmm. converted to paint. It's and, cutting back and forth. Yeah, and Rodora all, also almost gets killed and crushed by a thing. Oh my god, it's some Final Destination shit. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like a sculpture in her backyard that is placed just so, and she ends up crawling outside to find her cat and is is kneeling down in this perfect position mm-hmm. for this big this big sculpture to fall down and decapitate her, but it misses her. Yeah, so she's the only one who survives, Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, out of those three as it's cutting back and forth. Yes. Jake Gyllenhaal and but Joseph then, get killed. So this is as she's moving out. So she gets all the paintings out. She's, she's like, okay, she's I believe She's sitting you. down in the exact position that the woman in this painting, she owned, this Dees painting she owned is sitting, and then that's when we see the tattoo on her neck, the velvet buzzsaw starts like spinning, and then there's blood everywhere. Which is all right. It's like kind of a cool thing, but it's, I don't it's get also, it. <laughs> it. It's also this thing that was brought up in the beginning of the movie and then dropped for the rest of the movie, and then they made it the title of their movie, Velvet I, Buzzsaw. Yeah. Like, I think they just did it because it's a cool sounding name. It's a cool name. name. But wow, I, it... 
I guess if you want to try and and give it a legitimate reading, Please it's do. like okay, she's being haunted by her past as a anarchist, anti-capitalist. Because that's why David Diggs earlier is kind of giving her guff for it. Because mm-hmm. she's like, look, I grew up and I'm making money, and you know that was the past. That's what happens as you grow up and you gotta make money. Yeah, but this is like literally her her past self coming back to get its revenge. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess. Yep. Uh, Coco goes back to Michigan. And she drives by, importantly. Um, uh-oh. Lucy wants the Jeff Goldblum Funko. <laughs> That's fine, Lucy. I get it. Down. Nope. All right. <laughs> chewing on a machete. Let's not. <laughs> oh, my God. This cat. <laughs> Uh, uh, she she drives by people who have gotten hold of the Jesus from the storage unit, um, because that thing was just left. And yeah, now they're just selling Jesus on the street for five bucks. Yep. So Dees will live on. Yep. And then John Malkovich is drawing in the sand. Yep. During the credits, it's literally like <laughs> cut to black and then fade back, and it's <laughs> we see someone drawing circles in the sand while the credits are scrolling up, and then we see it's John Malkovich, and it's just a couple minutes of John Malkovich drawn spirals in the sand and i guess the moral being yeah he he's making art in the sand it's impermanent art yeah. i think is why it's important like it's the on the beach nothing yeah mm-hmm. it's not gonna last it's just art on the beach and he's just, just doing it for himself sake, which again is like a cool yeah i like that imagery i like the idea of, of impermanent art and doing something for yourself but it's it's kind of wasted in this yeah this movie. man this movie is just because like as we discussed it there were so many uh potentials that it had potentially interesting things it has this cast but yeah like natalia dyer's uh pointless here david diggs is pointless here uh fucking billy magnuson is pointless here like his character yeah. It's it sucks, man. Yeah. And I wish that I could be part of the apparently sizable group of people who really got a kick out of this thing. But I just it's boring. <sighs> yeah. There's there's better movies and better documentaries even that that really poke at the art world and how insane it is. Two I'm thinking of is one is Exit the Gift Shop, which a lot of people have seen, the one about Banksy, and two um, my kid could paint that. Have you seen that no. before? So this is a documentary that I've seen a bunch of times because I think it's so fascinating. Is this little this little kid, um, like drew like she she made a bunch of paintings that like have sold for millions maybe at galleries and shit, and there you always hear um when people are talking about modern art especially oh my my kid could paint that once the but in this documentary a literal kid does paint that and sells them for tons of money and then the movie also gets into the controversy of people are looking at this artwork which is modern artwork and they're like this is too good the dad has to be doing it and it gets into the the, like spiral that this family kind of and I've come out of this movie. I've seen it a couple of times and I still, I feel like maybe the dad help, has helped out, <laughs> yeah. but also whatever. <laughs> um, it's yeah, that, that's an interesting one. I would be curious to hear people's thoughts on it. And it's one I would like to rewatch because the last time I saw it was maybe like eight years ago. I'm also curious to hear people's thoughts about this one. Velvet Buzzsaw. Yeah. Let us know if you thought it was better than what we're saying, or if maybe your mind was changed by what we said or reinforced, whatever, man, mm-hmm. I want to hear. Cause like, yeah, it seems to be, um, we seem to have a contrarian Chris cabin style opinion of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, world was the world's most contrarian film critic. One of them, top ten. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wish yep. it was better. I know. But you know what? I'll I'll still check out anything else that these people do because I like them all. Dan Gilroy included. Man, Dan Gil, but he also did that Roman J Israel Esquire. Do you remember that last year? No, it what was, the fuck is that? So it was one where. What the fuck is that? <laughs> it was kind of like the uh, the wife this year where it was nominated for I think one Oscar and it was Denzel Washington for best actor and people were like, what the fuck is Roman J Israel <laughs> Esquire? Kind of like people this year were like, what the fuck is the wife? Yeah. It was that kind of movie. It's to be very mediocre oh. also written and directed by him and so a lot of people and i'm i'm also very worried about this they think maybe nightcrawler was a fluke you know what but make- he he did write the fall which is a movie i love you really like the fall i love it it's making sweet. movies is hard man Dude, you gotta is. let people fail sometimes yeah yeah you know 
sometimes and then they can come back and make something good. Yeah. It's fine. It's okay. And Night it, Nightcrawler yeah. is a gives him a ton of goodwill. Same, for me. yeah. It's and I, so and good. And I think like too, you kind of see the the crossover between this and Nightcrawler in terms of his worldview that I think is really interesting is like the hollowness of certain areas of entertainment and art and the human cost of those things. Yeah, because I, I read that he wrote this or, or was at least inspired uh, aspects of this. He worked for like a year and a half on a film project that then the studio canceled. It might have been. Yes, a su- it was a Superman movie. Yeah. yeah. So that could be frustrating and maybe, you know, writing something out of frustration might yeah, not always. Yeah. Be, yeah whatever. I, I think he. Yeah. I, I will still see whatever he does next. I. Yes. I, I, I like I appreciate his worldview um, and his kind of running philosophy in these things. Yeah. Yep. That's fine. <laughs> Let us know what you think, mm-hmm. and uh, then you can check us out on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, there's a subreddit, a Twitch, all that stuff. I'm at Carebex, C-R-E-B-E-C-C, on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, com. We have new pins. Oh, yeah. We have pin. We have Let's Get to the Kills pins. That's a cool-looking uh, pin. Yeah. Oh, and my personal Instagram, at James Agenese, I will post this awesome picture that Chelsea drew of me and Lucy or drew. Is that proper nomenclature? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Made uh, of me and Lucy for Christmas. It's fantastic. Yeah. But shoot us any emails at deadmeatpod at gmail.com. And uh, next week we'll have next that very week, awesome we're episode. We're going to explore your childhood traumas. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. It'll be a really good That's one. That's going to be a fun one. Yeah. Sorry if this one was a little all over, over the place. Yeah. I'm not really editing it. So I apologize. <laughs> it's, it's been a weekend. Man. Yeah. It's, it's been a thing. But yeah. hopefully it was as fun for you as it was for me. I had a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Until then, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast.